Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are on with one of the greatest doubles players of all time. Uh, won three of the four Grand Slams, a UCLA legend, a Bahamian legend, a legend of the Bulletary Academy before it was IMG, uh, a philanthropist, very important figure in the game, a commentator, um, all things tennis, world team tennis champion. The resume goes on and on, but most of all, he's a good person. Uh, he helped guide Marty Fish for a period of time and been a mentor to many in many different ways. Uh, welcome to the show, Mark Knowles. Knowles. Thanks. Bro. I appreciate it, man. I'm honored to be on. I'm glad I made the list, man. I love your show. You do a great job. <laughs> so I will say, uh, I played against a bunch of Bahamians in college and in juniors, and you were the first white Bahamian tennis player I'd <laughs> ever met, ever. They're like, Mark Knowles is from the Bahamas. I was like, he kind of had like a Montreal, Toronto kind of accent. It doesn't sound Bahamian. Yeah, I, I can turn it on when I need to. Um, obviously, <laughs> I left home at a young age. I left home at 10 years old. So I got that uh, kind of American accent going a little bit. But I remember when I used to call back home to my family and my friends and uh, my American friends, they would be gathering around me while I was on the phone. And I'm like, what, what are you guys doing? Give me some privacy. And they're like, no, no, wait, you're talking different. I, we don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't even realize it. But you know, when, I, when I'm with my crew, when I'm with my Bahamians, yeah, I, I speak a lot different. Yeah, man. I remember I went to, from Chicago to Florida uh, in Tallahassee. And, you know, Tallahassee, tons of gold teeth, country <laughs> accents. Uh, and, you know, after about two years, you start to develop this and you come back up north and you're like, man, you, what, what, how do you sound? We went, we went for you to go to college to finish your sentences, not truncate <laughs> the words. I was like, well, that's how they speak in the South. You know what I mean? So I totally get it. So tell me about growing up in the Bahamas because, you know, we listen, we, you know, we hear about Darian King and um, Sasha Vickery and people who sort of grew up in that region and talked about how there's not a lot of tennis there and sort of had the had to, you know, leave and maybe come to Florida, stay with friends, get a scholarship to an academy. Talk about how you even found tennis in the region. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Obviously, it's always a huge challenge when you're coming from a really small nation, especially from a, an island in the Caribbean where, you know, there's not much history, but I actually was very fortunate. Um, my mom actually is from England and she was a tennis player. She played at Wimbledon back in the day. So she had some strong tennis roots. She was traveling, I think, when she was in her early 20s, was headed to, the San, to San Francisco, actually, and ended up stopping off in the Bahamas, uh, fortunately for me. Uh, she met my dad and um, she never left the Bahamas. So, you know, I was fortunate to grow up there, but, you know, where, where it really was good for me was, um, you know, they ran a tennis club. My mom taught tennis. Um, they ran a nice tennis club there. They ran a great junior program. I loved tennis from a young age, I guess, because I just kind of grew up around it. Right. We didn't I didn't have much money growing up, so we didn't have a babysitter or anything like that. So. I would literally just be in the pro shop hanging out when I was too small to kind of walk. And then the minute I could walk, I would venture down to one of the courts where there was a wall and I would just hit tennis balls against the wall literally all day. Like people would tell me stories as I got older, like, wow, you're that little blonde kid that just st stayed out and hit on the wall for like 12 hours a day. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so, but you know, the good part about it was, like I said, my parents ran these, these great junior programs. I mean, it's all relative, right? It's a small country. Um, not that many resources, but the good news is they ran all these great summer camps. So a lot of my friends were there as well. So they weren't necessarily as serious about tennis as I was, but, um, you know, it was also a nice atmosphere. It was a lot of fun, which I think is important. You know, I mean, we see all the, all the kids today and all the professionals, and we all think about what's the right path. How do you get to the professional level? And, you know, for me, the two things that are super important is you got to have the love and the passion. If you don't have those two things, at some point, I, I think it be just kind of the motivation runs out, choices start coming into your life. And, you know, for me, I think back and it was really all about tennis, but it wasn't it wasn't in a way my parents never forced me to hit one tennis ball. Mm -hmm. I just loved it. Um, you know, I gravitated to it at a very young age and I grew up in that atmosphere. It was fun. We had summer camps on my friends. Um, so I, I love the sport from a really young age. And so I consider myself fortunate because as things developed, um, you know, we actually had some good tennis players. Um, obviously, you know, you know, the man himself, Roger Smith, Slinger. 
Yeah. Um, you know, he was my guy, but you know, my mom kind of taught him how to play tennis. So we had this relationship. There were some other players, um, you know, that didn't make it on the circuit. There were good juniors, Michael Knowles, Darren Roberts, um, Sterling Cook. Like we had some really good players. Sterling Cook played at um, University of South Carolina. Um, you know, they went and represented the Bahamas at Sunshine Cup, which was a big team competition pre Orange Bowl. They don't have it anymore. Um, I remember my dad was actually the coach one time. I was just a little, little kid kind of trotting along. But, you know, I had so many great influences around me. I had older people um, that really kind of, you know, perpetuated my, my love and passion for the game. My family was always super supportive. And um, so I think that really helped me a lot, even though I didn't have the resources that, you know, maybe somebody from a larger country like the United States or Australia or Spain. Um, I just love tennis. So, you know, and the people around me that were closest to me also loved the game and it didn't really matter what level they played. I didn't have to be at the best level, didn't have to be a top junior per se, but we kind of all got together, right? It was all about that experience, um, you know, and, and those relationships, you know, my, my times with Roger Smith, when I first turned pro him showing me the ropes on tour, I mean, they were so valuable. The times that I spent with him, just, you know, having somebody to kind of teach me the ropes and, and kind of learn about the tour. So, um, and obviously I went to Balotelli's at a really young age. So I was in that professional landscape, you know, my best friends at, at Balotelli's, Andre Agassi, Jim Courier, um, other guys like Martin Blackman, uh, David Cass, David Whedon. I mean, we, you know, it was, it was quite a roster of players and there's many more, by the way, Chris Garner, Ricky Brown, Jimmy Brown. I mean, the, the lineup was absolutely incredible. So, to be able to grow up in those types of environments where you're just pushing each other each and every day. And more importantly, you love doing it. Um, so I, I think that's where I got really lucky. Now, how'd you decide to go to military? Cause obviously your mom, you know, had the pedigree, knew the game could probably have done it from start to finish. How did you decide to, it was time to leave the Island and go to military? Well, you know, it's funny when you think about any sport, right? The, the journey to becoming a professional and getting to be the best you can be. You know, there's moments that you look back on very important moments, right? And the first one for me was obviously my family that was super supportive and introduced me to the great game of tennis. But the second one and, and probably the biggest one was I was playing the Orange Bowl Junior Tournament. I think it was nine years old at the time. I was in December. Yeah, I was nine playing the 12 and unders there. And Nick Boletari saw me playing, came up to my mom and said, wow, you know, I think your, your, your son has a lot of talent. I'd love to have him come to the academy. I'd love to offer him a, a full scholarship. And uh, you know, I was, I was one of those kids. It sounds crazy, but from a young age, I knew I wanted to be a professional tennis player. I knew I wanted to be, you know, my goals were to be number one tennis player in the world. I mean, as crazy as they were, like I was all in on tennis and probably because we didn't, you know, we didn't have many things in the Bahamas. We, you know, now you hear about the great athletes, the, you know, the Rick Foxes, the DeAndre Aytons, our track girls are amazing, but you know, we didn't have we had no organized sports. Like I talked to my kids now, I've got three kids and they ask about, you know, they play a lot, a lot of sports and stuff. And I just said, I didn't really know about baseball, football, basketball. We didn't have any organized leagues or anything. So I grew up playing tennis and I was actually a swimmer, believe it or not. And I'm proud of it. I was the number one swimmer in the Bahamas till 12 and under till I quit. So I could have been the next Michael Phelps, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you know, um, so it's kind of different. You don't have all those options. Um, uh -huh. So, you know, I think I was hyper focused and, you know, it was a tough decision. Obviously I was 10 years old, but once again, I got very lucky because there were a couple other Bahamians that actually ended up going to Bolletaries the same, same time I did. Um, Sean Cartwright, uh, Emil Knowles, Kim Griffith, who actually ended up marrying Sean Cartwright, Jody Saunders, Emil Saunders. So I was super lucky because here I am, I wanted to go to Bolotaris. My parents weren't so sure, 10 years old, your kid going away. You know, back then, you know, there's no cell phones or anything, no fax. There's nothing. Right, I right. used to get, Nick makes a joke. This little blonde kid would, I'd have to get like a little, um, I'd have to get like a step ladder to put a quarter in the phone booth. You know, we had these phone booths, which anyone listening probably doesn't know what that is, but it was something we used to use back in the day, back in 1981. <laughs> Um, you know, to call back home. So, you know, you're, it's not like today where you're FaceTiming and you can feel close. You are far and we didn't have much money at all growing up. So I only came home twice a year. That was at Christmas and for summer, that was it. So I was very lucky that I had the support system. I had a couple other Bahamians. They looked out for me. I still remember to this day, some of the older guys, you know, they were three to five years older than me. So 
they were my protection as a little 10 year old pipsqueak. I got picked on a lot, mm. but you know, I, I had some, I had some big brothers that would take care of things for me. So, um, so that's how I ended up at Volatari's, you know, if it wasn't for Nick Volatari, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't have become a professional to give me that opportunity a full scholarship. As I mentioned, we, we had no money growing up. We could never afford to go to a place like that. So to get that opportunity and, you know, it, it was very strict when I first went, which was great. It taught me so much discipline, determination, um, I loved my time there. I mean, obviously, it's been well spoken of Andre's time there, him writing a book and so forth, and you know Jim Kerr as well. Um, but I really loved it there. It was an opportunity I knew I would never get again, probably. And coming, being in a small country like the Bahamas, you don't get options like that. So it was really my mindset. I'm going, and um, I'm, I'm thankful that I did. Now, let's your take on academies, because you know I run a small academy in Chicago, and I feel. Uh, always like caution parents. So, you know, you got the big academies that is 75 to 100 grand a year. Always say, if you really belong there and you really have a shot, you probably get some level of scholarship. And if you got to pay full freight, probably don't have a shot, right? Yeah. Uh, or or end up in, when I say don't have a shot, I mean at the tour, right? Because we all know yeah. there's, there's yeah many levels of success in tennis going to college and getting a scholarship is a level of success but in terms of like this kid has it this kid's going to make a living playing on pro tour if you're there and you're not sort of being invested in by the academy eh. so what's your take on how do people evaluate whether or not to go to an academy yeah it's interesting i mean i think the academy um you know it, it's changed a little bit right i mean nick was really the first harry hopman but nick was really the first to kind of allow this opportunity for super talented kids, right? To go on a full scholarship myself, Andre Agassi, Curry, the list goes on, right? We could uh, take up 10 minutes of the, of the podcast, but um, you know, and then there are obviously kids there playing, paying full boat, um, which were basically, you know, supplementing us. So we, we had to work for it. I mean, we had scholarship jobs. I had to get up 7 a.m., clean toilets, clean kitchens. I had to sweep seven, we had seven uh, hard true clay courts, which was great, right? That taught us, hey, you're going to get something, you know, you got to pay for it, even though it might not be monetary, mm -hmm. you got to give us your time, you got to give us your effort. Um, you know, I think what you said is interesting, because, like I said, I love the academy. I think if, if you're of a certain mindset, if you can ascertain as a parent that your kid is of a certain mindset, then I think you're only going to thrive because you're around similar type mindset players, um, personalities, and I think that really helped us. We, we had a unique time at Boletari's where, you know, I think we probably had three to five of the top 10 in the world in every age group, which is crazy competition, right? So we didn't really know outside of Boletari's. We just knew it in each other. We wanted to beat our friend. We didn't want to lose to him. So we just kept pushing each other. And then when we did go out and play satellites, when we were 15, I think 14, 15 years old, we played our first satellite. We, we started winning professional matches at a really young age, right? So mm -hmm. it obviously worked. And then back to your other point, you know, I think what I see now, like when I went, to, I went to IMG Academies a couple, maybe two years ago, and what a place. I mean, it's it's completely different than the voluntaries that I was at a long time ago. And, you know, it's an incredible place, place, but as you said, it costs some money to go there unless you're, you know, offered a scholarship based on talent and potential. But I would say that it's more, it's now an early investment, right? If you think your kid, even if he's not that good yet, but if you think he's really passionate and loves the game, when he's in an academy environment, whether it's your academy, a little smaller, intimate, or a big one like IMG Academies, if they're fully invested, I just think it's an early investment because you're going to end up getting a college scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to save you money on the back end. So from that standpoint, I actually think it's a good investment. Now on the flip side, if your kid is not that passionate and just kind of, <laughs> you know, just kind of whimsical about it then no you're you're you could do better with your money probably um kind of my take on it but you know it, it's interesting because i have some kids that play different sports my my second my second son plays a bit of tennis and when he saw img academy he's like i love this place i'd love to go here and that was a couple of years ago i think it was only 11 or 12 and my wife and i looked at each other and we're like no we're not letting <laughs> our 12 year old go away like no way right so it's hard you know Obviously, my parents let me go, but I wouldn't let my kids go away. That's it'd be hard. They'd have to be a little bit older. Um, ah. So I think the academy is tough, right? Because it is tough to leave home. You know, I remember one of the big um, 
issues for Andre Agassi when we were at Knicks was he he felt that he was deprived a little bit of the the normal high school experience. I didn't know what a normal high school experience because we don't have we don't have high school football and proms and stuff like that in the Bahamas. So <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't aware that I was really missing anything. But, um, you know, Andre felt like he was missing something. So it was a big sacrifice for him. Um, so I think it depends on the individual. And I also think it depends on the parenting as well. Now, you talk about Andre and Jim Currier. When you all were there, was it evident that Andre was going to be as good as he was? Were there, was it a time where Jim was like, eh, Jim is better now? And Andre just sort of soaked up all the hoopla, which, which can make you play above your level, right? Uh, or were they always sort of neck and neck? Yeah, it's an interesting one, right? Because they're two entirely different characters and me kind of being the, the third wheel in that, you know, <laughs> just kind of gauging the characters, you know, um, Andre was, I got to say, I mean, I think the first time I saw Andre was, I think we were 11 or 12. Um, I think he ended up coming to Ball Terry's maybe He's a year older than me. I think he came around 12, 13, but I saw him a little bit earlier. We were at the, used to have a big world junior tournament called Sport Goofy in Orlando. And we were, we were hanging out a lot there. And yeah, I think you could see it early that he had something pretty special, the way that he could time the ball. I mean, we hadn't really seen anyone that could just stay on the baseline and, and just time the ball like so incredibly well off both sides. You know, he struggled, but it's interesting. The guys that he lost to at that stage, as you'll know very well, come out knowing tennis as well as anyone, is that if you pushed against him, you beat him all day long because Andre wasn't going to change his game. He was going to stay up on the baseline one time and take everything on the rise. You know, at, at 12, 13 years of age, you get those guys back there that can just push and run all day. Um, they, they usually would get the best of him. Um, and then Jim was... Jim was a lot different because Jim was not, and I knew Jim, it's funny how I met Jim because I was a ball like I said, at the age of 10, Jim's a year older than me as well. So we used to play literally every weekend in the finals of a junior tournament in Florida. He was still at home. He was from Dade city, Florida, always in the finals. play this Jim Courier kid who was just tenacious, right? I mean, tenacious. He would beat me most of the time. And I was just like, so we became pretty good friends. And, you know, then finally it was like, Hey, you're at Knicks. And, and he's like, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to come. So he ended up coming over. And I tell you from day one, Jim Courier was such a hard worker. I mean, he had this determination, you know, didn't necessarily have the fanfare that some of the other players might've Andre being one of them, uh, you know, David Wheaton, uh, even Martin Blackman, Ricky Brown, Chris Garner. Like there, there was a long list of really good junior players with a lot of talent. Um, but Jim was, he was stone faced in his determination. I mean, I, I have a really funny story about it because Jim, Andre, and myself, we were sitting around the dorms one day um, at Knicks. And I think it was, it might've been, we were watching the French Open. We were, we were probably 14 years old or something. And Jim just stone faced looked at us and he said, I'm going to win the French Open one day. And, you know, you know, being like 14, 15 year old kid, you know, you start laughing, right? You start, it's like your buddy saying, hey, I'm going to go win the NBA championship. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go be the best player in the world. You know, you're like, yeah, whatever, dude, you know, and funny enough, you know, I mean, and, and what does he do? He wins it twice, right? I mean, he's just, he's one of those guys. Um, I've always admired how hard he, he's always been a hard worker, but I think the thing I admired the most about Jim was super competitive world at Bolitaries, as you can imagine back then. And we were all a little crazy in our own way. We didn't like to lose, whether it be, you know, throw a couple of rackets, break rackets, you know, not that strong mentally. And then all of a sudden one day, Jim just said, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm never going to lose another match because of like my attitude and my approach to the game. And it's funny enough because, you know, people that didn't know him before, once he started having so much success on tour, they were like, wow, this guy is the strong, you know, he's so strong mentally, so focused, he's whatever. But he actually changed. So it's actually a good testament that, that it can happen. You know, I see some of the players nowadays, you know, maybe they have a poor attitude or don't have quite the right approach. You can change. Um, you know, even for myself, personally, I was, I was kind of a mental midget for a lot of my career, especially when I was playing singles. And ultimately, I did change, and it helped me a lot. Unfortunately, it was a little bit too late for my singles career, but it helped me a lot in doubles. It became a lot stronger mentally. So it's interesting comparing their personalities, but, uh, you know, we're all – teenagers with with big dreams not having a clue whether we would ever achieve any of them <laughs> now you, you you touched on you know how you um sort of your mental sort of uh capacity sort of hindered you in the singles right 
and I always like had this conversation with lay people. And it was like, well, I don't understand how somebody can be number one in the world in doubles for so long, like the Bryan brothers, right? Uh, and not be great at singles, right? And I'm like, well, half of a court makes a big difference. Yep. So what, you were number one in the world in dubs, won three of the four slams. What do you think was the biggest thing that, you were missing or needed to do differently looking back on it to maybe have that success translate more into a top 10 singles career? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think it's hard. I put a lot of pressure on myself. I mean, I, I didn't come from much, right? We, we didn't have much money growing up at all. So I kind of, you know, as we see with a lot of athletes that are successful, it was, it was my way out, right? I mean, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself and I was my worst enemy. So quite frankly, I kind of know that I underachieved in singles as hard as that is to admit. I'm, you know, I'm older now, I'm more mature. I know that I underachieved. I was a top hundred player, but I, I should have been a lot better. And the reason I didn't do better is totally because of my mental approach, put too much pressure on myself, just didn't, you know, and as you know, Kamal, you've been out on the tour and you've worked with so many great players, you know, Grand Slam champions. It seems easy, but it's really not, you know I mean? And there was a time I think, you know, I started to really, truly believe I was working with Jose Higueras. I was having some big wins. I beat Rios. I beat Kerton. I was starting to really get some wins that validated, you know, what other people were saying. But more importantly, finally, I was starting to believe. And for me, I got injured. I had a big injury. I, I broke a rib in my um, in my back and I was out for 10 months. So that actually, you know, it sounds crazy, but it actually came at the worst time for me because I had finally kind of mentally my game was really good. I was playing good tennis, but more importantly, I had finally started to believe that I was going to move up the rankings, that I was going to be top 50, start challenging, you know, getting to where, you know, having grown up with, you know, a bunch of alpha males. And of course, two of my really good buddies, Agassi and Courier achieved so much at a young age, became number one in the world. And, you know, you start looking at yourself going, well, geez, I'm a failure. Like I look at what my friends are doing. They're doing amazing. So, you know, there's a lot of pressure. Um, and like you said, you know, I've, I've worked with a couple of guys since I retired and you just try to help work them through it because, and, and also doing TV, doing commentating, just got to be careful to judge. You have no idea what athletes are going through. And, you know, it helps that I've experienced it. So I know like we, it may not be apparent. It might not be a story about it, but you know, whether it's pressure at home, whether it's financial pressure, whether it's peer pressure, there's just so many things and, and it's all highlighted in tennis, right? It's an individual sport. Um, I think that for me, doubles came a little bit easier because I had the skill set. First of all, I was, you know, pretty quick hands, really good at the net. Um, and I also believe it or not, I, I like the team atmosphere. You know, my best memories in life are Davis Cup. Like, I mean, playing as part of a team, it just, it's special maybe because you're such an individual for most of your life. So I think that part of doubles, I really liked. And, and also to be honest for me, like I said, I started to really master the mental side. Um, but it is, it's a lot different, first of all, covering half the court. But second of all, you have a partner. So right. if you start getting nervous or tight, like I can say, hey, come out, dude, I'm feeling a little nervous here. I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm going to kick my first serve in. Help me out up there, you know, like right. do whatever. In singles, you know, you, you, you get tight or you start losing confidence. There's nobody to fall back on, you know what I mean? Now we've introduced a little bit of coaching on the men's side, but generally there's no coach. There's nothing. It's just you. So that's what makes tennis really special, really unique. I think that's what makes people really grow. Regardless, I love the, the sport of tennis, regardless of what level you play, because I, I think it teaches you so much about yourself and who you are. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, you know, also having somebody to help you problem solve. Yeah. You know, really is like, all right, where should I go? Like, oh, he's, you know what I mean? Like to, to have somebody there with you to help problem solve is a big thing. So let me ask you this question because, you know, there are some Grand Slam champions that feel that in addition to their serve or their forehand, whatever, their mind was one of their biggest weapons and advantages over others with bigger serves and bigger forehands, right? Or bigger move, you know, better movers. What do you think now about the impact of coaching actually taking away, right? Or even propping up somebody who, um, you know, perhaps doesn't have that them. mental yeah. weapon, right? <laughs> you know, and even yeah. in the playing field, like, yeah. do you think that Serena would have won 23 if the people she was playing against in slams, right, yeah. had the ability 
to ask for one opinion about an adjustment that needs to be made. You know what I mean? Because all those slams weren't two, two, they weren't two and two, right? It was, no, 100%. Close, is, right? It's, a, it's a great question, right? I mean, honestly, where, where I lie on this, I'm against the coaching. And I, I understand the push for it, especially from a coaching standpoint. Coaches want to be a little bit more relevant. You, you know, they're good arguments as far as, you know, not just their relevancy, but also, like you said, um, producing a better product, right? I mean, you know, having coached some of the great players, if you could go down and tell them one strategy, it would change things you know, enormously during a match. But what I do like about not having coaching is exactly what you just expanded upon. You know, you can go, you can have your coach go over a game plan, have everything set up. Once you get out on that court, things start to flip and things aren't, you know, your opponent all of a sudden his back end's not weak today. He's hitting his back end great. You know, you told me he could only go cross court. Now he's going line. You got to figure it out. Right. And that's what I think. I mean, tennis is one of those sports, of course, some of the greatest athletes in, in the world of sports for sure, but it's still probably a 80% mental game. Right. And so with coaching, you take that away and I'm probably a prime example of it. If you would have given me coaching in my singles career, I would have done way better way better because I would have had a coach that come on the court and go, Hey dude, you know, settle down. You're just getting to, and then I would have been able to play my tennis. Right. Whereas, you know, my opponent was like, this is awesome. He's just, he's just breaking down. <laughs> like, and, and that's, that's part of it. Right. So I don't, that's the part I don't like about coaching. I think that there's, you talk about the mental side. I mean, for Serena Williams, you know, she goes somewhere where others can't. Right. on her own Novak Djokovic Roger Federer Rafael Nadal these great champions I mean their mental fortitude is it's off the charts and we, and we see it in other sports as well whether you, whether you're talking about you know Kobe Bryant Michael Jordan Wayne Gretzky that's what makes them unique they, they can go somewhere that others can't and I think that others could go to that spot with help with coaching um, so that's the part I don't love about it. But like I said, I do understand, Hey, the world is changing. Um, you know, like I said, I, I think the coaches want to feel to be a little bit more a part of it. Um, but like I said, I personally, I, I think tennis is such a unique sport, right? There's no other sport in the world, not even boxing, boxing. You have after a three minute round, you got your trainer, your fight guy in the corner, giving you a pep talk. Right. Tennis is the only sport you have no help when you're in the arena. None. Yeah. I mean, that's so cool. That's so cool. No place cool. to hide. You can't no you can crawl under the bench. No timeouts. The time's not going to run out. No, it's the best. I love it. Yeah, and I say, you know, this it is a country club sport primarily in the U.S., yeah. but those who get good at this sport are very tough people cool. because once you step out there, I mean, beside the umbrella, behind the player bench, there is not a single place to hide, right? And if exactly. you can't stand up, in front of 15 to 20,000 people and handle judgment and criticism. And, you know, then this, this isn't for you. So I always admire, no matter where a kid came from, they you know, developed a sports out of privilege, right? Versus yep. struggle to still make it to that level. They're not a punk. Like they're not no punk. You know what <laughs> I mean? So that hundred percent. I just I, like, eh, he played tennis, but he ain't no punk. You know what I mean? I got the utmost respect for tennis players. And I, you know, I'm fortunate to have some friends that are professional athletes in other sports and I admire every single sport, but Hey man, I'll, I'll speak proudly for tennis players because, you know, the, the mental pressure, not just the physical, I mean, look at the athletes today. I mean, it's, it's incredible how they cover the court and, but the mental pressure that you're under performing as an individual, that's second to none. Well, let me ask you this. Cause we talk about coaching. We talk about slams. When I look at like the, the the your Grand Slam career, right? You won a Slam almost every two years, right? You had 2002 Australian Open, 2004 U.S. Open, 2007 French Open, and then mixed in 2009. So there's like eight Slams in between those, right? And I always say when someone makes a run to a Grand Slam, a lot of sh had to go right, right? Yeah. Whether even if it's just I was in a good place off the court, I was dating somebody, I was this, it was that, or I was healthy, or what do you think went right on those runs, right? Because, I mean, it could be the draw opened up, you know what I mean? But it's always like, man, something has to go right. A lot of things have to go right to win a slam, even in judge. Yeah, yeah it's, it's funny. I mean, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> I don't have a great record in finals. I'm, I'm three and eight in men's doubles grand slam finals, which is, I think, about probably 
every other day, not every day, every <laughs> other day. <laughs> um, you know, but of course, there'd be a lot of people who'd love to be in 11 finals. Um, but I think all athletes, right? Uh, okay, I won three. If I won four, I wouldn't have been happy. If I won five, I wouldn't. Have, the only way I would have been happy is I won 11. And then I would have thought, hey, I should have won 12. Why didn't I make a 12 final? So, but I mean, the way I kind of, the way I kind of come to terms with it, I think, is that I actually try to be non-biased and really break it down. There was, there was probably three more slams that we should have won between having match points, being up a break in third, lucky shank miss hit, you know, doubles as quick points, those things. And there was only one that I probably shouldn't have won. So somebody owes me something for sure, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm okay with it. A lot, lots of therapy. I'm, I'm getting through it. Right. Um, but you're right. I mean, a lot, you know, a lot comes through, you, you know, having coached players that win majors, it's, you know, it's a long process. It's two weeks. There's a lot of people around, even if it's just doubles. I mean, the prestige of winning a major is huge. Um, and you want that, especially somebody like myself who grew up, you know, idolizing Bjorn Borg with, you know, just watching breakfast at Wimbledon. You know, like I said, my goals were to be the number one singles player in the world. I wanted to win majors and singles. I didn't do that, which is disappointing. But hey, I'm, I'm very thankful and happy that I had the opportunity to, to do it in doubles. Um, happy that I got to get, you know, be number one in the world in doubles and number one in the world at anything is, is pretty special, but you still always want more. Um, but like you said, things have to go right. I mean, on the day of the match, they have to go right leading up to it. They have to go right. And, and I think that's, what's wow. I mean, there are a lot of amazing things about Serena Williams and the big three on the men's side, but you think about how much they continue, they make it look just easy right. and it's not, I mean, <laughs> you know, forget that you've got seven different opponents right. you know like you know you got to prepare for seven different opponents every other day different right. different you know pressures it's just you know it, it's really difficult to win a major and um you know roger rafa and novak they're making it look <laughs> rather easy and and serena has throughout her entire career as well but you're so right there's there's just you almost it's so cliche but you know this you got to just think one match at a time. You can't ever, you know, as you know, your first thought is, okay, let's get past the first round. Because that's when you're the most nervous. You know, everyone's nervous in the first round, everyone, including the top players. And then once you get under the belt and you feel a little more confidence, then you think, okay, second week. Okay, let me try to get to the second week. Then when you get in the second week, pressure really ramps up because you know everyone's playing great. You know, there's eight, eight people left and they're all playing great and they're all thinking the same thing. I'm going to be holding that trophy come Sunday, Saturday. Right. So how do you navigate that? So um, it, that's why it's so special when you win it, when you win it, it's, it's memories that you take with you for a lifetime. And so, just as devastating when you lose it as you, as, uh, as, as oh. Mark, you're being <laughs> so negative, bro. Let me tell you to be, no, no, I'm not being world. negative. I'm actually not being negative. I'm actually being real. <laughs> like I'm actually like, I'm a super, you know me, I'm a super happy, positive guy. <laughs> Everything's been great for me, but Hey, like any athlete, I'm, I'm very honest. What I was the disappointment brutal. I still remember clear as day. We, you know, Daniel Nestor and I, we had two match points at the U S open in 1998. Mm. One of them, he put the ball away and clipped the net on the way down. So like you talk about match point, the next match point, um, I hit a volley winner on the sideline that was called in by the lines person and then overruled late. We all know those calls yeah. didn't have Hawkeye back then, but they had Hawkeye up in the booth. And John McEnroe was doing the match. He comes to me right after the match and he goes, Mark, I hate to tell you this, but your volley was in. You guys won. You know, so those type of things. Yeah, those are hard. I mean, I'm, these are years later now. And I still think about I, I wake up in a cold sweat every now and then and, yeah. and start throwing stuff. But, you know, but like I said, I'm real. I mean, hey, uh, I'm totally real. Is the disappointment still there? Of course. But the, the joy of the ones that I did win, that's still there as well. Well, but to be number one think, in the world. But I and, think one thing also come out, this is sports, right? I mean, I think this is also the reality of sports. There are a lot of highs and there are a lot of lows. And you got to be able to, you know, as Rudy Yard Kipling says, as you walk on the center court at Wimbledon, you got to be able to meet those two imposters the same. Triumph and disaster. And I don't think there's ever been a truer statement. Those that can do that normally do the best. Yeah. I think number one in the world. Winning three out of four slams, that's that's a hell of an accomplishment. 
I want to talk about life at UCLA because we talk about the academies. We talk about, you know, how now they've grown into these big businesses and 98% of the kids are going to end up going to college. I always tell people, uh, to me, I look at like a program like a Florida or UCLA or USC as like the D league in basketball, right? You wake up, it's sunshine, great facilities, great coaches, great competition every match. Practice two or three times a day. The way they run it is very individual pro-like, right? You come in, get your individual work. Maybe you do a team, maybe you come do some more stuff. So I always say, if a, you know, if a kid's on the fence between UCLA and somewhere else, I'm, I didn't go to UCLA, I went to Florida and now. But having practiced there a lot and been around that, that is just a great environment for an athlete. Tell us about your years at UCLA. Was Billy Martin there then? Yeah, Billy Martin was the assistant. Glenn Bassett was my head coach. I mean, so it starts like this. So actually, I graduated high school at a young age at 16. I'd like to tell you it's because I was a lot smarter than the rest, but it's just because I started early. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's that homeschool, right? <laughs> yeah. So when I graduated at 16, we actually had the voluntary traveling team. So myself... Agassi, Courier, Garner, a list of guys, we actually, I took a year off. Um, we actually traveled and played professionally, like, um, which was an incredible opportunity for us. And um, so I think I got, you know, I got to like 300 in the world. Um, Andre and Jim, they, they obviously got top 100. I think one of them had secured a title. I think Jim won a tournament down in Chile. Um, and so I decided, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, my game's maybe there, but I was like, Honestly, having traveled at that age, 16 years old, the world, I was like, no, I'm not really ready. So I, I took a year off after high school, but then I, I went to UCLA. And part of the thing was growing up in the Bahamas, you hadn't heard of too many places. I heard of UCLA, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Like that was, I was like a dream for, that was another dream coming from a small island. Like, wow, UCLA is recruiting me. Like this is super cool, right? So went to UCLA, as you, as you know, the facilities were incredible. The sun, it's 78 degrees and perfect every single day. Um, also, back then, a lot of pros, as they do now, were practicing at UCLA. I, I used to practice with John McEnroe a lot when I was in college, which is crazy for me. I, I grew up watching McEnroe and Borg breakfast at Wimbledon in the Bahamas, right? <laughs> like, you know, so here I am, Johnny Mac calling me up. You know, I got a really funny story, too. My, my sophomore year at school, I was rooming with three golfers. And I was at class and I came back. Actually, I was at practice. Came back and, and one of the guys goes, dude, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but somebody just called there claiming that they're John McEnroe and he left a number. Like, they're like, I'm, I know he's you know, obviously lying. <laughs> and of course it was John, right? So, I mean, I was lucky. I practiced with John McEnroe. I think Glenn Michibato was a really good player. There were a lot of good pros. Um, Pete Sampras was there. Like, there were a lot of good pros to play with yet alone having a great team. You know, we were one of the best teams in the country, great coaching. And also I kind of knew, you know, they knew that I was interested in playing professionally, obviously, whether I was going to stay one year, two year, three year, four years, they didn't know. So it was kind of that mindset. You know, I was kind of free to kind of continue to develop my game, which is important. You know, there've been so many great players um, that went to UCLA that achieved so many great things on the pro tour. Obviously Arthur asked Jimmy Connors, the two biggest names, but a, a lot others as well. Um, so it was really cool. I mean, you know, the weather's huge, right? You, you got perfect weather every day. You go to school in the morning, get your classes out of the way. You're never going to have any rain outs. I think we had one rain out in three years that I was there. Um, so it was awesome. I, I loved UCLA. Incredible coaches were awesome. Um, you know, Billy Martin was my assistant. Of course, he was a, a great junior player, knew a lot about the professional ranks. So I think a lot of that, you know, was really part of the reason I chose to go to UCLA. It was a little far, you know, Nick Volatieri wanted me to stay closer. He wanted me to go to Georgia, actually. I almost went to Georgia just so I could be close. He wanted me to come back to Volatieri's on certain weekends and keep training. Um, but ultimately I decided, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go West Coast to the West side. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me ask you this, because a lot of players, well, you know, now you're maybe starting to see it, but you know, you had a time to, you know, after you sort of post playing, right? You start to figure out. Uh, and in tennis, you kind of retire early, right? So, you know, you're like mid 30s, 40, right? You're like, okay, shit, what do I do with the rest of my life now, right? So you went on and you coached Marty, Jack Sock, Milos. 
how did you like that? Because as a player who was as good as you were, it, I mean, I was just okay as a player, right? I was more like sort of mental, strategic, analytical. You know, my talent wasn't necessarily in my hands. Um, so it's easy for me to sit on the sideline and not be like, just give me the racket, I'll do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but for you, you know, that that's kind of hard where you're like, oh, you know, you should have did this. Tell me how that experience was coaching those three guys. Honestly, I actually really enjoyed the coaching. So, you know, the way the coaching started towards the end of my career, Marty Fish and I, we'd been good friends for a while. And he just kind of said, hey, you know, we were actually playing doubles. Um, and he's like, hey, would, would you be interested in coaching me while you're still playing doubles? And kind of, you know, I was playing a, a smaller schedule, more limited schedule, just because I had some kids now. Um, and so I was like, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd love to. I'd always admired his game, super talented player. And, you know, it was interesting. I think the reason I enjoyed that part of coaching is first of all I'm pretty analytical as well like I was one of those guys that I don't know I pick things up pretty quick like I mean I'm, I'm pretty technical all that stuff so I, I really enjoy the whole breakdown process of tennis like looking for weaknesses what does a guy do on big points what are his tendencies I love that stuff um, but more importantly I think why I really enjoyed it is because exactly what I said kind of my failures you know my ability to kind of gauge honestly what I did right in my career and what I did wrong in my career, I felt that, hey, the one thing I could really do is help somebody else, right? It was, like I said, it was a little late for me in singles, but it did help my doubles career once I kind of understood everything. And so Marty was kind of a prime example. You know, when I first started working with Marty, he had started to rededicate himself physically, he had the fitness going, but he didn't have quite the belief that I had in him, which was interesting, right? Like I, I saw Marty, I saw his game and I was like, man, you could be top 10 player. Like you could challenge and made like get to the second week of majors. You should be beating guys like Andy Murray and these guys. And he was kind of like, really, you think so? And, you know, so I think for him, I brought a huge level of confidence and, and by breaking it down, I was literally like, okay, this is what you do really well. This is maybe one of your weaknesses. We can improve this, but let's compare it to the rest of the field. Like at the time I was prime example. I was like, find someone outside of Federer that's in the top 10 that volleys better than you, right? He's like, yeah, you're probably right. Okay, and you got a great serve, you got an amazing backhand. Okay, sometimes the forehand can be a weakness. Like, so I think I really enjoyed that part. And then to see him do so well, right? Get to seven in the world and challenging quarters of Wimbledon that year, quarters of the Open, like playing really well, made the World Tour finals. You know, that brought me a lot of joy. I mean, obviously the joy is on the athlete and he was super pumped and, super excited that he got to these levels, but even for me, right? Cause I believed in him, right? As you know, when you believe in your player and, and they start to play well, um, that's really exciting. Um, you know, I remember also when I worked with Milos Raonic, we, we worked together for a short period, but it was leading into Wimbledon and he was struggling a little bit mentally. He really, you know, and I just started working with him and he was defending finalists from the year before. So he had so much pressure on him. We got to Queens. And I'd known Milos for a while, obviously, from when I was playing and so forth, but never really got to see his game. And I was coaching him the first week in Queens. And I remember after three days, I called my wife and I said, wow, this guy's an amazing tennis player. Like, he's incredible. Like, he was beating guys in practice that week, 6'1", 6'2". I mean, he was just, you know, big server like him, but he was hitting the ball from the back of the court, moving. I was like, this guy's an incredible player. And, you know, he didn't do well in Queens. He lost early in a tight match. Confidence was way down, like literally zero going into Wimbledon. And, you know, working with him, we got his confidence back. He worked through, he had some great wins. He beat Sasha Zverev on the way, made it all the way to the quarters and lost a tough match to Roger Federer, right? Like that's pretty rewarding because like I said, I, I kind of know what that is. I, I know what the feeling of losing your confidence, putting a lot of pressure on yourself Okay, it might not have been at that same level in singles, but, you know, I played at a very high level at doubles, but I also did play a lot of high pressure singles matches as well, maybe not late in slams. So I think the ability to relate to those guys, but ultimately help those guys was super rewarding. Yeah, the selflessness it takes, right, to be a coach. And I think, you know, when you are like the night before a match or, you know, even with a slam, right, the moment the first round is over, you start looking, you got like two days to really kind of get it right. And you always have multiple statements and multiple plans in your head. And you got to like choose one. Which right? one? 
I know, right? And when it works, <laughs> yeah. right, it is not for your own stuff. Like I'm, I'm glad. A, I'm glad that it worked because that's personal rewarding to take the right gamble. Yeah. And I'm happy for that player, right? And I think that's that's the part. It takes a special person to coach because you got to be a, a person that has the ability to be happy for somebody else. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think you know, and to like you know feel rewarded with the really small piece of cheese. And you know I think I, mean? that, I think that's important as well, because I think all the coaching assignments that I took on, you know, our first conversation really was like, listen, I'm not choosing to be coaching you. Like, you know, I, I've been on the road for 24 years. Like, I, I don't need to be on the road a, a ton, but I'm choosing because I believe in you. Right. So like if, if, if at some point that doesn't work, just tell me, hey, thanks for your time. Let's roll. Right. right. We're done. Um, I, think, I think for Marty, you know, that was probably the first time for him where he had a coach that was like literally, you know, I, I kind of told him how I felt on everything because I didn't really care if I was still working the next day. Um, all I cared about was making an impact and really helping him. If I'm not going to help you, dude, I, I don't need to travel the world. I've, I've done that many times. Um, and so I think that's leaving important. Kids, you no, know, you know, that's a fine line in coaching, right? That's a yeah. fine line, and it's a very difficult line. Because now, you know, about Jack Sock, Jack Sock, yeah. to me, best doubles player in the history of the game. History of the game. Wow. Oh my god! Oh my god! The boy can play some dubs. No matter what kind of shape he's in, no matter what his singles career is doing. That boy you're can play. Sock, you're taking sock over John McEnroe all the time. In dubs. Yeah, I'm saying in dubs. Well, you tell me. I say I didn't yeah. play against John, right? You probably did. I say yes. Listen, so, you know I've I've got the utmost respect for Jack. I will answer your question for you, and I'll give you a nice answer that will keep you out of any controversy. <laughs> Jack is the best doubles player in the modern game. Yes. So because doubles has changed tremendously, right? Since McEnroe played, since I played. In today's game, Jack is an incredible doubles player. Serves extremely well, big first serve, heavy kick serve. So, you know, his serve can allow, even if the guy at the net's not a great volley, it can allow him to have easy volleys. Yeah. And guess what? If you don't go to the net guy, you're going to the forehand of sock, which is one of the best in the history of the game. So that's nasty. Yeah. Um, then he's got terrific hands at the net on your serve. He can, he can hold for, you. he's not going to make too many mistakes. Yeah. He returns well and he moves, he moves on the doubles court. You know, I was, I was actually coaching him when he and Mike Bryan played the doubles final at the U S open. I think they played Lucas Kuba and Marcos and uh, Marcelo Mello. And that's the greatest doubles match I've ever seen. Jack Sock did not miss one ball the entire match. <laughs> and no disrespect to Mike Bryan, who's one of the greatest doubles players of all time. But literally anyone could have been out on the court that day. Jack Sock, every single thing he touched turned to gold. And so that backs up your statement. He has the ability to completely dominate. And his record speaks for it. I mean, your, your statement is very valid because he's won doubles titles with pretty much anybody. Um, you know, most of them have been good players, but he, he can win doubles titles with anybody. So I would say that he's the best doubles player in the modern game because his game, you know, the way game is the way the game has changed is from back in the old days, everybody used to serve and volley. Now it's more of a serve and stay back and a plus one with the big four and the first strike. Um, and then second shots, Jack's second shot, very hard to find his back end. forehand is electric. And, mm. you know, he, one thing about Jack Sock that I've always said, he's one of the best athletes I've seen. I mean, I'm when I started working with him, he's one of the best athletes I've seen. He's got just a tremendous athlete. He's fast too, like just like he's soft, just, but move soft. But he's yeah, fast. like quick. Like that's the thing. Like you know, there's some people that like when they're moving, you can hear them moving. Yeah, right? and you can feel it, like in the court, like pounding. Jack moves. I mean, he's a he's a shape Jack, out of shape. Jack, it don't matter. He still moves so soft. Jack sock in form is electric. I mean, yeah. he, and, and listen, when I coached him, I, I, I tried to help him a lot with that. Just saying, listen, I mean, I actually played him when I was still playing. I actually played him, which was really fun. I played him at the U S open um, and I beat him, but boy, holy smokes. He was hitting four ends at me. And I, I consider myself to have pretty good fast hands back in the day, but they, there was some miles per hour coming behind it. But, you know, I was almost a, almost part fan of his, right? Like, I just like, 
because I know what he was bringing to the tennis court, I would try to tell Jack, like, dude, you have some really special stuff, right? Like you, forehand's one of the best in the game. Um, serve is super heavy. One of the best second serves in the game. It's heavy. And, you know, obviously he's a little bit weaker on the backhand side, but the other thing he does incredibly well is he moves. So, you know, when you talk about, as you know, when you talk about, you know, trying to analyze a player, break down a player, he's got so many great attributes. And I think part of him a little bit is, is also trying to believe that we all talk about it, but it, it's similar to what we talked about for an athlete to kind of truly realize their potential. As you know, very well, Kamau, it's not till they actually start to believe it, right? Once they start to believe it, they go to a next level. Now, last thing I want to talk about is the Olympics, right? Five-time Olympian, which folks, that, that doesn't, that's not telling his age, right? But <laughs> What, what's strange is that with, with all of your success and your crew, you know, the gym, the Andre, it's so weird for you to be playing the Olympics for another country, right? Because people view yeah. you as like yeah. American, UCLA, Floridian kind of thing. Tell me about that experience, right? Because, you know, when you play for a small country, they depend on you. Yeah. You know, like the Darien King in Barbados, right? You in the Bahamas, they like depend no matter what your ATP ranking is at the time, whether you're a singles player or double specialist a small country depends on the guy that's currently yeah. making a living on the ATP tour. Tell me about those five Olympics. Yeah. I mean, Olympics are special. I mean, you know, it's interesting, right? Because my, I told you my mom was British. So when I was about 16 years old, um, Great Britain made a, a hard push for me to play for Britain, um, you know, which financially was probably a stupid move that I didn't make that decision. <laughs> but this sounds crazy in today's world. The reason I didn't make the decision was it wasn't about money for me. Like you, you've been to the Bahamas. Like I am so Bahamian, like my Bahamian people are the greatest people in the world. Like playing for the Bahamas has been the greatest joy of my life. And Davis cup was always the most important, but also Olympics, man, we're in the village. You know, I'm friends with all the athletes, the track stars, the swimmers, we're a small country. You go into, you know, you go into an Olympic village coming from the Bahamas, you know, we're opening ceremonies. We're like, like 30 people right and there's like 3,000 the other contingents um but you know everybody's enamored by the Bahamas too because Bahamas is a great place right best place in the world um but you know they're so special uh you know my only regret is that I don't have a medal um came very close in Athens um played with Mark Marklin in Athens and uh we took out the United States and in the, in the round of 16 took out um Alex O'Brien and Jared Palmer played great. And then we got in a quarterfinal match against South Africa, which was um, David Adams and John Diager, who, you know, we, we should probably beat. Um, and we ended up losing, I think, 22-20 in the third, like a ridiculous match. Murky, my guy, played awesome, played great tennis. We had our chances. And that, that was to go into the semifinals where we would have played uh, Canada, Leroy and Nestor, who are, are obviously a very good team. Nestor was my partner. Um, you know, maybe definitely not the favorite there to win that, but even if we didn't win that one, we would have been in the third, fourth playoff and we probably would have played Albert Costa and Alex Carreccio, who are not necessarily double specialists, obviously incredibly accomplished singles, singles players, but I like our chances. So we would have had two matches to secure a medal, man. And that's, as you said, coming from a small country like the Bahamas, you know, we, even though we didn't get a medal, we had a huge parade when we got home because, the Golden Girls took home gold because we're the best athletic nation in the world, as you know. I don't need to fill you in on that. Um, you know, so the pageantry is incredible, you know, and still to this day, you know, we got Shawnee Miller, who's just dominating in the athletics. I mean, it's it, you're so proud when you're from a small country. And, you know, I'm, I'm so close to the people of the Bahamas. I mean, it's, it's home for me. It will always be home for me. So playing five Olympics, you know, first couple, I actually played singles in Atlanta, um, lost early there. But played the first couple of Olympics with Roger Smith. We had a great time. We did, we did okay. I think we can make quarters in Atlanta. No, round of 16s in Atlanta. Didn't really come as close as I did with Murky in, in Australia. And it's funny because in Australia, um, Roger Smith was our coach too. So that would, that would have been really cool. And then I played my final Olympics in Beijing with my boy, Devin Mullins, played, played college tennis at Ohio State. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the Olympics... It's, it's funny because you don't grow up as a tennis player. You don't grow up thinking Olympics, right? You're thinking 
you know, ranking and majors. And then all of a sudden it became an Olympic sport. I think it has a lot more meaning for the smaller countries because I, I don't, I don't know this, but I know this from my friends from the Bahamas that won medals, how big a deal it was. Right. So it, it all, it started to grow on me. I remember the first Olympics in Barcelona. I didn't quite understand what a big deal it was, but by the time I got to Atlanta, sorry, by the time I got to Athens, that's when I truly was like, I want a medal bad. Like I, I'm going to try really hard to get a medal. Um, didn't work out, but um, I think it's a really cool experience. Olympics is so unique. It's different. It's that whole team thing again. You know, you're going in the village and, you know, LeBron James is ordering a Big Mac. You know, it's crazy. And then there's some, some athlete from, you know, in Europe that you've heard of that's incredible. They're right next to you. It's just, I guess it's like being in college all over again, except everybody's a better athlete that's standing next to you. <laughs> I know, right? So I think, I think about uh, tennis in the Olympics uh, in terms of meaning, right? I think of Andy Murray. Yeah. Right? Winning the Olympics um, on grass. Big deal. And I think of Monica Pui. Talk about small yeah. countries, right? And being the first, first and only Ooh. Olympic gold medalist in that country. You know, Americans like, yeah, would you take a Grand Slam over the Olympics? Right? Which one would you rather have? You obviously rather have a Grand Slam. But like you said, from a small country, you like enter like royal, you become royalty to that country, uh, no matter what sport it is to win a gold medal. So that's- uh, I'll tell you the biggest, the biggest regret I have now over not having a medal is, is when you have like, um, when you have kids, you know, there's like career day where you show up with your kids. It would be really cool to show up with a medal. <laughs> right, that's where you go, where you go medal, would, right? That would kind of separate you from the rest. That would, that'd know, be right? cool. <laughs> Probably when my kids get old enough, uh, I can I can bring that thing. You know, like, I, uh, I help, that I thing is nice and tiny. Yeah, yeah I help someone achieve their dream. For now, my kids are like slapping the dog on the ass with a tennis racket. No interest in playing. Um, but, but I tell you, I tell you another. I tell you a really funny story. And uh, you know, you think of Andre Agassi and Steffi Graf, two of the greatest players of all time. How many majors they have? So. Um, I was at their house a couple of years back, believe it or not, you could walk through that entire house and never have an idea that either one ever played a sport. <laughs> There's not a trophy in sight, which I really admired. I thought that, I mean, you know, Steffi, we all know Steffi somewhat. She's like the most humble athlete ever and, and arguably one of the greatest female athletes ever. Um, so, you know, it's slightly different. There are others that, that have the trophy room and, and set everything up. Yeah. Um, last thing. So I touched on my kids. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, maybe my staff is 17 year old, right. Who's pretty good, you know, good forehand moves. Well, serve kind of sucks. Right. Um, <laughs> didn't really take to the game. Like I thought she would. Yeah. Given the number of the quality of players who like stayed in my house at one point or another. Right. Yeah. Uh, then I got the five and seven year old boy who I'm like warming up to the game. Um, do you have like this dream of one of your kids? Obviously you want them to become what they want to become, but given the fact that you come from tennis lineage, right? With your mother, um, do you feel any type of way if your kids don't gravitate towards the game or at least reach a respectable level? Yeah, it's an interesting question because my oldest son, Graham, you know, he was still, he was young, but he got to experience, you know, my journey kind of on tour the most. Um, you know, it's funny. We won Indian Wells, well, Indian Wells one year. I put him in the trophy, right, on the court afterwards. Like, you know, so he got to absorb everything. I'd always put him on my shoulders after winning tournaments and so forth. And he didn't gravitate towards tennis at all. He, he plays for fun, but he's, he's a big sport guy, football, basketball guy. Um, my 14 year old son, a little bit more, he didn't really get to see, you know, me playing at my best, seeing what daddy does. He was still too young. Um, but he plays a little bit tennis, likes it. My daughter who saw none of my, my career plays a little bit as well. I think that that's a tough one. I, I think honestly, my only realistic expectations for the two younger ones who do play tennis, I honestly just would love them to get to a level where they could possibly get a college scholarship. I've never even thought to become a professional. I, and I think maybe because I think tennis is so hard. I really yeah, do, so awesome. you know, seeing the team sports in the United States. I mean, we could all talk finances and whatever the next level guaranteed contracts. I just think those are e not that they're easy, but I think they're less harsh. Tennis is, 
I, I think tennis is just very, you know, I'm on the board of the ATP, so I'm trying to tackle this a little bit as well. I just think the way to become a professional tennis player is so costly, so expensive, such a drain on families. And that's, that's a, if you're a middle class. So just imagine if you're not right. Like, I mean, from the grassroots level, it's, it's very hard. It's such an international game. You know, like I said, I was fortunate to be a Bulletarius and get my stuff paid for to travel the world. We went and played um, satellites back in the day. I don't think we have satellites anymore, but played satellites in Hawaii. We played satellites in Africa, believe it or not. We played satellites all across the world. We could never afford that type of, of, of expenses. So I think for me, if they really wanted to pursue it, of course, I would support them. But I also realize maybe I'm just a little jaded. I think tennis is so hard. I think it's so hard. It's gotten harder since I played. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the game has expanded. Um, there's so much more into it. Of course, you know, there's more money in the game, but still not, you know, you, you think these guaranteed contracts you see in these other sports. I mean, goodness, you sure would love, that'd be nice to have a guaranteed contract. I mean, think about how much pressure that would alleviate yourself and many others. If you, if you knew you had, you know, I remember when I turned pro, okay, I was somewhat heralded. So I, I had a small contract, you know, clothing and, and rackets, but not, not like a guaranteed contract in a team sport where, you're like, wow, this is nice, right? I can just focus on my body, my game. Don't have to worry about paying bills and whether I can fly to the next city or I might have to drive. Like, I just think, but on the other side, I think tennis is such a great sport. So that's why I'd like them to play, even if they're, I just like them to play, even if it's just um, recreational. I think it's a great sport. But like I said, I'd love it if they played college tennis. That'd be cool. I mean, I admire, I admire the, um, you know, the quarters and so forth. Like you look at Peter Corda to have his son playing at such a high level after he was number two in the world. Like that's super cool. Um, you know, I just think it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to follow in, in the shadow of a successful parent. And obviously the quarters have navigated very well. Yeah. Uh, and then I, we have someone else who, someone else recently. Rude. rude. Yeah. Rude. Like it's incredible. I used to play against his dad for a long time, uh, yeah. Christian. And, and I, and I, being a father, and as you were just asking, I'm always curious, how did they, how did they make it fun and passionate for him, right? Was it, was it intrinsic like it was for me, just because my mom grew up around tennis, I just, tennis? Or was it like, hey, you should play this game? Like, it's very interesting. And I talked to Peter Corda about it a little bit at, um, at Indian Wells this year, because, I mean, obviously, <laughs> he's got two daughters. They're also top 10 in the world. I mean, three kids. He, as a parent, you can't even imagine that type of success, right? I mean, we know how hard it is for one, you know how hard it is for one kid, first of all, just to get a college scholarship, forget professional, right? right? And, he's, and he's got three that are professional at the top of the game because court is only going up as well, just remarkable. Yeah, you wonder if it was like very sit down, let's write a plan, let's like calculate it out, let's like really put some intention behind it or is it like, eh. Because you know, you know, the, you know, the dangers and the pressures, right? I mean, if you think about tennis is actually unique and that's probably why I admire, you'd have to say that Corda, I, I always had this belief that it's very hard for the next generation after one of the greats to play tennis. And we've seen that, right? The uh, McEnroe kids don't play. Okay. Borgs, Leo starting to play a little bit at a decent level. Um, Becker's kids don't play. Edberg's kids don't play. On the female side, you know, Everett's kids don't don't play. You know, I, I can't think of any, right? Peter Corda on the men's side, for sure, is the highest ranked player to have a really good player in the next generation. Um, you know, you see it in other sports, right? You see it with Del Curry, who was a really good basketball player, great shooter. Son turns out to be <laughs> the greatest shooter we've ever seen of all time. My, my boy, i got to mention him, Michael Thompson from the Bahamas. Yeah. <laughs> number one draft pick out of college. Yeah. Laker, Tim Hardaway, Tim son. Tim Hardaway, NBA, son. Yeah. How about you know Michael Thompson's kids, right? You, you think about Clay Thompson, but you got Trace Thompson who's playing for the Dodgers. You got Michael Thompson Jr. who plays, you know, he plays in Europe. So you just think, and, I, and I'm I'm pretty close with Michael, and I try to ask him, you know, what what was the guidance? And he said, listen, I just support. Support was the key. So I think there's there's a bit of both, right? They got to have a bit of the love and the passion, and they got to have supportive parents. But either way, it's super admirable. Well, man, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, I appreciate you. I respect you. 
Uh, always grateful for your contributions to the game and what you contribute and what you continue to do. I think your work on the ATP board is your voice is, you know, from a guy that's in a locker room, you know, just a fly on the wall, right? I think you're one of the most respected guys on tour and I think they value you being on the board. Uh, Thanks, appreciate it. So, you know, keep it up, man. Keep being you. Uh, this has been the Tennis.com podcast with Mark Knowles. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Kamal. Thank See you soon, man.